very much, Paul, for that very kind um, introduction. Um, before I begin the speech, there are just a number of people that I would like to thank. I would like to thank uh, Paul and the Bar Council for hosting this uh, seminar today. I'd like to pay particular tribute to the IIEA and to its Chairman Brendan Halligan and Director Dahi O'Callig and to the others in the IIEA who work so hard to achieve what Una described as really a very serious think tank that makes a huge contribution to Irish society. I'd also like to pay tribute to Gavin Barrett to thank him for his excellent speech, but it's typical of the quality and serious nature of the work in which he's engaged and the profound and very thoughtful commentary that he makes in this area of European law, which is so vital to us all. Today, I'd just like to offer a few views on the matters touched on by um, Gavin in his speech and also raise a few additional matters for consideration. Firstly, as he says, the proposed amendment to the treaty um, is being done, obviously, in the area of financial stability. And it is, I won't say the natural outgrowth of the developments that have taken place in the last two years, uh, perhaps it's a non-natural outgrowth, because I believe the legal basis for the mechanisms that are in place at the moment to ensure financial stability of the euro are legally sound and that there is nothing in the existing treaties that prevent their implementation. As you know, um, Regulation 407 of 2010 established the European Financial Stability Mechanism, which enabled the Union to provide financial support subject to strict conditionality embodied in a memorandum of understanding for countries that were in difficulty within the euro area for serious financial difficulties. And of course, that was not done while that support was very welcome. It is not done in terms of some financial benefit that has been conferred on Ireland or other countries that had difficulties. It does, of course, confer a benefit. But it has been done because it is perceived to be an essential part of the stability mechanism that in itself is essential for the preservation of the euro. And the financial support that is accorded under that mechanism is paid for at market interest rates um, on the basis and taking account of the cost of funds uh, to the European Union. In addition to the EFSM, there is the separate context of the European Financial Stability Fund, which was decided upon by the Council of Ministers on the 7th of June 2010 and involves setting up the EFSF, a company which will make financial support available to countries within the Eurogroup, and its financing is supported by guarantees of the member states. That structure is done outside of the treaties and is done by the member states in their capacity as sovereign states, independent of the union structure. It is difficult to see any credible argument that either of these mechanisms infringe the treaty. As Gavin forcefully pointed out, Article 122 permits the granting of financial support where a country experiences exceptional, uh, exceptional difficulties due to circumstances beyond its control. And it is difficult to see or consider the present difficulties being faced by Ireland, Portugal and Greece as anything other than the type of difficulties that were thankfully provided for in Article 122. And certainly given the approach to interpretation of the treaty and European instruments, it would be a new departure to say that Article 122 could not be uh, interpreted so as to ground and provide the basis for the EFSM, which is the legal basis for Regulation 407-2010. Separately from that, the states are entitled to exercise all their sovereign powers as states unless there is something in the treaty which uh, takes away that power. And I don't believe there is anything in Article 125 which takes away the power of the countries who are members of the Eurogroup, the 16 countries members of the Eurogroup, as they were then in 2010. 
to decide that they will provide financial guarantees to another entity to enable it to make loans on commercial terms to other member states. The necessity for the amendment has come about because of domestic difficulties in Germany and the fear that if uh, there was not an explicit treaty provision authorising this support, that the Bundesverfassungsgericht might declare the present um, uh, procedures or the present facilities illegal. Of course, that would be the view of a particular domestic court of a particular member state and would not be the view of the entity and organ that has the sole and ultimate responsibility for the interpretation of the treaty, namely the ECJ. But whether or which we are where we are in relation to the matter, and now an amendment, as Gavin has explained, is, uh, is going to be introduced to put an explicit treaty basis to authorise support in the circumstances described in the draft uh, treaty amendment to Article 136, which Gavin um, identified. And those powers will be conferred. <coughs> if anything, they can be viewed as a restriction of the existing powers because they will only be allowed to provide support where this is indispensable to safeguard the stability of the euro and where it is subject to strict conditionality. The Commission, as Gavin has said, has expressed the view that this does not involve any increase in competences of the Union, that this will enable member states outside of the treaty structures to do what is the normal sovereign right of a member state, namely to provide financial support or any other financial arrangement with any other country. And it is difficult to see any credible argument to the contrary. This is a recognition of a power that I think is clear clearly enjoyed by the member states under the existing, tre existing treaty. And it is an affirmation of that power, a removal of any doubt in relation to it. But the financial support, unlike that provided under Article 122, will not be provided by the Union, but will be provided by the member states in their sovereign capacity. So when you come to look at Article 48.6 and the power that is provided by Article 48.6 to amend the treaty. As Gavin has pointed out, that can only be exercised where there is no increase in competence being conferred uh, on the Union. The fact that the Member States take the view expressed in the Council decision that it can be so exercised, the fact that the uh, legal basis is conditional on there being no increase in competence is obviously a further legal affirmation that there is no increase in competence. And indeed, it would be for the ECJ to express a contrary view as the guardian of the treaties. But first principles make it clear that what has been done is an affirmation of the entitlement of member states in their own right as sovereign states and not an increase in the uh, competences of the Union. The next matter that I would like to address is the Crotty decision and just to add a few thoughts um, to those expressed uh, by Gavin. First, it is a misunderstanding of Crotty to believe that every amendment of the Union requires a constitutional amendment. Crotty did not so hold. Indeed, it held to the contrary. And the provisions of the SEA that were incorporated into domestic law by the 1986 Act involved amendments to what was then the uh, European Economic Community. And those amendments were held to be within the essential scope and objectives of the treaty, and therefore something that the licence granted by the people in 1972 and enshrined in Article 29 of the Constitution, as it then was, entitled the state to accede to uh, this new treaty and to ratify it and to have it incorporated as part of the existing economic community. That much is absolutely clear from Crotty. And it didn't matter that these new provisions were not necessitated by existing obligations. That will inevitably be the case where you are looking at amendments to the treaty, 
they cannot be necessitated by the existing treaty if they are indeed amendments. The fact that they are not necessitated doesn't mean that Ireland cannot ratify them without a constitutional amendment. You then go on and look at the second issue, whether it is within the essential scope and objectives of the treaty as it stands at the particular time, and you make a judgment in relation to that. And the licence given by Crotty is quite broad, because back in 1986, there was an increase or a more explicit delineation of competences of the European Economic Community as it then was, and it was said that the provisions in the economic community that existed were really suggested that these developments might take place or gave some indication that the community as a progressive um, institution was going to move in those areas, particularly when you considered Articles 2 and 3 of the community as it then stood. It also recognised the entitlement of the government to agree a movement from um, unanimous voting in council to qualified majority voting in council, so that even though on one view that was a diminution of Irish sovereignty, because it could no longer by its vote prevent a measure being passed in council, the court took the sensible view of recognising that it also had a positive aspect, because of course the fact that you can't veto something has the corollary that another member state can't veto something that you want, so that there can be advantages to the country. But in any event, that movement from majority to qualified voting that was perhaps less clear in the context of the the, the 1958 treaty as it then was, that did not require a constitutional amendment. Neither did the creation of a new court attached to the Court of Justice require a constitutional amendment. So Crotty is clear in that. And every proposal for an amendment of the treaty therefore requires a careful analysis to see whether it does require a constitutional amendment. The second issue dealt by, with by Crotty was not something that involved any amendment of the treaty, the European Economic Community at all, and sometimes sight is lost of that. It dealt with Title III of the SEA, which provided for closer cooperation in the field of foreign policy and required the member states who had ratified that treaty to cooperate more closely in the area of foreign policy, to consult one another, to agree common positions where possible, and to agree principles by which they would conduct foreign policy. The Supreme Court split 3-2 on whether that required a constitutional amendment. The majority held that it did because it involved a restriction of the government's right under the Constitution to decide on foreign policy, a right that is subject to certain limitations under Article 29.5 because certain decisions in the foreign policy sphere require approval by the the Doyle. But it it is a right that is fundamentally given to uh, the government under Article 29. The Supreme Court said something that is actually unsurprising. It said, this is the constitutional architecture. This is the area of sovereignty of the government. This is what the Constitution says is the government's role. And if the government enters into this treaty, it has abdicated some of that constitutional role. It has fettered its area of uh, discretion in foreign policy. And that alteration of the constitutional status given to the government in the area of foreign policy is something which requires a constitutional amendment because the constitution at the moment sets out what that power is. This treaty would restrict that power and it would have very serious and significant consequences. Now, the division was really in relation to whether the consequences of entering the treaty were as serious were serious or not serious. The minority took the view that it really only involved a duty to talk and consult and that any government conducting foreign policy will talk from time to time and perhaps make promises to other countries. That's inherent in foreign policy. Mr Justice Walsh and Mr Justice Henchy in particular thought it went much further, that it was an imposition of a very significant restriction on the government. 
because it did require them to do certain things and undertake in good faith to do those things, to cooperate, to consult, to agree uh, positions. And that was an unacceptable restriction. So it's very important to bear in mind that for all the criticism of Crotty, most people who criticise it, or indeed most people who wish to ignore it, don't actually analyse what it says and a careful analysis, an analysis that it is legitimate to disagree with in the context of what the implications were of Title III, but nevertheless an analysis in terms of principles that is perhaps harder to disagree with. Because it made a simple point that every country will recognise that to cede sovereignty is a very serious matter. And therefore, when you engage in a treaty that involves a cession of sovereignty, you must look closely at that and see whether there is a licence to do that. And the licence can only come from the constitution or from the approval by the people if it is not already provided for in the constitution. And that means that when there is any amendment proposed to a treaty, it is necessary on the current law to apply the Crotty principles. And one of the uh, difficulties I think we suffer from, not just in this country, but I think it's also a European phenomenon, is that sometimes people, when they want a result, are inclined to let that influence their interpretation of law. And indeed, a notable feature of the development of the European acquis is the sometimes doubtful basis, legal basis, for some of the proposals that are put forward in a European context. And it is necessary to carefully look at the legal basis for those proposals. Similarly, every time there is an issue in relation to a referendum or a an amendment of the treaties, people put forward views as to whether an amendment is required without necessarily setting out the analysis to justify that view. Gavin Barrett, of course, is a, a very honourable exception in relation to that. But there are some amendments in respect of which there is no doubt that a constitutional amendment is required. There are others, perhaps, where there is somewhat more doubt. But one thing is clear, that there is a duty to examine it in the context of Crotty, but also the importance to recognise that Crotty is not the vice grip that some people suggest it is. That Crotty provides a structure for making a decision, and a structure which allows considerable leeway in the context of a constitutional amendment. Because remember, the union that we are now dealing with, founded on Lisbon, is very significantly different from the community that was founded on the original Treaty of Rome. And changes to that community, which now may look not very significant, but in '86 represented a very significant departure from what was agreed in '58 were sanctioned by the Supreme Court as being within the original licence. When you look at the areas of our lives, both personally and the lives of the member states, to use that phrase, that are now governed by European Union law, the extent of majority voting, the spheres of influence of the European Union, the integration at a political level, the integration at an economic and monetary level, then it is clear that in that new context there is far greater scope for uh, amendment of the treaties that will not necessitate the holding of a referendum. The next point I want to deal with is just to understand how Crotty applies. There were some who suggested that in the context of Lisbon a constitutional amendment was not required. And nowhere did one see necessarily the analysis to support that contention other than general assertion that uh, Crotty did not require an amendment in each case. But it's important to highlight the distinctions between Lisbon and what we're talking about now in the context of uh, the proposed amendment or perhaps amendments in future. Lisbon, of course, introduced and made part of European law the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And while that applied within the scope of the area of European law and had to be obeyed and was addressed to the institutions, it was a very significant alteration in terms of the protection of fundamental rights that hitherto had been part of soft law but was now an integral part of the treaties 
and the same status of the treaties. Its potential for effect on the rights enshrined by the Constitution was obvious, particularly when taken in a context that the rights enshrined in the Charter, where they coincide with the rights in the European Convention of Human Rights, have to be interpreted consistently with that convention. And of course, that convention has only been introduced in Irish law at a sub-constitutional level. In circumstances where the Union is now going to exceed to the European Convention of Human Rights, which is its own consequences in terms of interpretation of the Charter. And in circumstances where, although the uh, Charter is addressed to the community institutions, it has the potential, depending on how it's interpreted, to affect rights of individuals in individual disputes. Paul Craig, in his book on the Treaty of Lisbon, identified a possible interpretation of the Charter which would impact on litigation between individuals and not just in litigation between individuals and the state. As he made clear, and as we all know, treaty articles have vertical and horizontal effect. And horizontal effect means they can be prayed in aid in disputes between private parties. Article um, 151 of the treaty of the TFEU provides for equal pay for men and women. Article 23 of the uh, Charter provides for a more general um, equality in all spheres between men and women. And he said, if somebody brings an action against another individual that ends up in the European Court, the European Court is a European institution. It is one of the addressees of the Charter. And the question will arise whether the, Europe, the, the European Court must then apply the broader concept of equality enshrined in the Charter to that dispute because it is applying European law. There are all sorts of complex issues about the potential effect of the Charter which were significantly ignored in any of the analyses of whether a, a treaty amendment was required. Mr Justice Keane, in delivering the Brian Walsh lecture here two months ago, said it was absolutely clear in the context of the Charter, and for that reason alone, a constitutional amendment was required. Secondly, nobody seemed to address the very fundamental issue of what was the protection given by the existing Constitution to European measures. Because under Article 29, 410 of the existing Constitution, measures that are necessitated by membership of the European Community and the Union founded in Maastricht were protected from constitutional invalidation. But of course we now have a, un a new Union. Article 50 of the uh, TEU gives for the first time a legal personality to the Union. Secondly, Article 1 of the TEU provides that the new Union is different from the old Union. It is now a union founded on the TEU and the TFEU and shall replace and succeed the earlier community. And how anybody could conceive that one could take any risk with the essential protection of European measures from constitutional review in the context of a new treaty, when Article 29, 410 did not apply to that treaty, but applied to the earlier community which was gone and an earlier union which was gone. And, of course, the consequences of not having that constitutional protection, as Mr Justice Walsh pointed out, in Crotty would be horrific because, at an international level, Ireland would be required to um, ob uh, be obliged, as a matter of international law, to fulfil commitments that it couldn't, in fact, fulfil because the constitution prevented it doing so. Um, a third matter that seems to have been overlooked is that Article uh, 12 of the um, TEU and Article 3 of the Protocol on National Parliaments give a new role to the parliaments in uh, the various member states. In Ireland, the role is given in a bicameral uh, uh, legislature to both the Doyle and the Shannon. These are rights to raise issues and objections in relation to community measures that infringe the principle of subsidiarity, an entitlement to send back to the Council and the Commission um, any measures that they say infringe that principle which must then be reviewed and the consequence might be that those measures are never enacted. 
Our constitution provides that the government, as I said, has sole control in the area of foreign policy, subject to very limited control by the Dáil. Now you have the Dáil being given a role in foreign policy that it never had, and the Shannon. Where is that in the constitution? How could those powers be consistent with the constitution? So what you have to do is you have to analyse each measure and decide whether it does require a constitutional amendment. But the important message is there is nothing in Crotty which says that every measure uh, requires, uh, every amendment requires a, a, a constitutional amendment. The next matter I want to uh, look at briefly is where we are now in um, a European context. We have spoken about ceding sovereignty, but concepts of sovereignty evolve. And Ireland and other member states have seen in the last few years how notions of national sovereignty must be put in perspective, that the extent to which member states, and particularly small member states, enjoy sovereignty is limited by the realities and complexities of a, a modern global economy with global finance influencing matters in member states. So sometimes people get concerned that amendments to the treaty have some uh, terrible consequences in terms of sovereignty. It is very important, as I say, to analyse sovereignty in the correct way and to recognise the limitations that al already exist on the sovereignty of the member states and, in fact, the support for sovereignty, which, being a member of the Union and in the context of the Lisbon Treaty, has provided to Ireland in the present context. I don't think anybody would gainsay that Ireland could not have survived the present crisis without the support of the Union. So this is something that is important to understand. And we still perhaps have a tendency in this country to want to be fully part of Europe, but in a sense to sort of hold something back and reserve that in case there's something we don't like, we'll be able to put up our hands. In a sense, we're beyond that in the dynamic of European integration. And it is right that we should be so. Because Europe, on any version, has been unequivocally beneficial for this country. One of the disappointing matters about the last constitutional referendum was this concept and relativisation of law that I've already spoken about, where people opposing the treaty put up the spectre of legal consequences of approval of the treaty that were wrong in law, had no basis in law, and yet are used as a means of, in fact, interfering with people's informed and reasoned choice of whether one should or should not approve amendment. And as Gavin Barrett said, we should not believe that the default situation is a referendum, because referenda, particularly subject to the legal constraints in this jurisdiction, do not always yield the most democratic result, particularly where you have uninformed and completely wrong assertions with regard to the consequences of treaty amendments and the difficulty in explaining these concepts in a, a referendum context. Also, it was interesting to note that on the last occasion, there were many issues as to what were the consequences of Ireland's rejection in the first referendum. Bruno de Witt, in a, a book entitled, or sorry, in an article entitled uh, Consequences of the Ratification Crisis, posited a number of arguments that were in currency at the time. And again, these arguments had no basis in law. But it is a feature of modern discourse that where, as I said, a desired result is, is sought or rejected, that people clothe arguments with a legal basis. It was suggested there was a basis for going ahead with uh, the Lisbon Treaty on the basis of some form of enhanced cooperation, leaving outside the states that were not part of it. That had no legal basis. There was a suggestion that Ireland could be expelled from the existing union because it had not ratified. That had no legal basis. In fact, there wasn't even a provision for voluntary withdrawal from uh, the European Union. There is now in the uh, Treaty of Lisbon, but there wasn't then. There was um, a suggestion that somehow the uh, Treaty of Lisbon amendments could take effect as soft law, rather like the Charter had been up till then. Again, that was wrong. And it is very important in our discourse and analysis on these vital issues that we properly analyse those issues and we come to a reasoned conclusion and a reasoned approach in relation to them. 
because the issues at stake are so vital for this country that to lose them in the confusion of inadequate analysis, inadequate understanding, is a cost potentially far more severe to this country, is a far greater potential diminution of our sovereignty and of our ability to ensure that Ireland prospers and continues to, to uh, reap the benefits of uh, European Union. I, I, I leave you with the words of Tony Yutt, the great European intellectual who spoke in his book Europe, a Grand Delusion, uh, published in 1996. He spoke about the fact that Europe had achieved something quite remarkable because it started as a legal construct and now it was something more than that. It was an ideal. And he said this was exemplified by the fact that in the early 1990s, when you had 15 members of the Union, that people spoke about, European countries spoke about joining Europe. Europe was something distinct from the landmass of Europe. It represented an ideal, a belief in how the future could be achieved and could be maintained for mutual benefit. That is an ideal that, as I say, yielded very significant benefits to Ireland. And all you have to do is reflect on the fact that in 1945, Europe was in devastation. In 2011, despite the crisis, you have a Europe governed by, Euro by the rule of law, with all the enormous rights and benefits European citizens have, when circumstances such as existed in the 40s are now unthinkable. That is an enormous achievement in the space of little over 50 years, and in one sense is in fact the high point of world civilization. Homo sapiens has inhabited the earth for 200,000 years. It's only in the last 50 years that the nations of Europe, and indeed anywhere in the world, have been able to come together and construct a legal structure that has yielded benefits in terms of protections for citizens' rights, protections for countries, that were undreamt of 50 years ago, even undreamt of 30 years ago. And for all the criticisms of lawyers and legal difficulties in a European context, it is worth remembering that the European ideal and the European structure has was really given an impetus and has survived and has evolved as a dynamic structure through the groundbreaking decisions of the European Court in the early 1960s, which identified that organic ability to grow and the protection and enshrining of the rule of law, the provision of ways in which the rule of law could be protected. That was a legal construct, and it is important to remember that Europe is grounded in the rule of law. I say that in a present context for two other reasons. The present tendency, exemplified by the Deauville uh, Declaration, for member states of Europe to go outside the European structures, the legal structures, and decide things outside, has to be seriously deprecated. That is not part of the European ideal or the European structure. Secondly, I think it is important in the, presence, in the circumstances of the present crisis to remember this. We are part of a European ideal. We are constantly reminded of the European Union spirit, of the need to cooperate. And in the present circumstances, it is completely wrong to place any pressure on this country to cede any rights in the area of taxation, rights that are recognised in the treaty as being the sovereign rights of this country, and to do so at a time of economic crisis. Europe is built on the rule of law. We are entitled to assert th those rights, and they should not be linked with any question of reduction of interest rates for Ireland. Either those interest rates are justifiable or they're not. If they're not justifiable, it is wholly improper to link them with any session of sovereignty by informal pressure. If they are, and they are not correct, if they are right, then of course the issue doesn't arise. So while I am a firm believer in the European ideal, I think it is important to remember that the European ideal is a construct and an evolution and an outgrowth of the rule of law. And if it is to continue to prosper, we must respect the rule of law, both in the context of constitutional amendments or the necessity for them and the uh, assessment of the necessity for them in this jurisdiction, and in the context of the development of Europe and obeying the rule of law to achieve that development. Thank you very much indeed.